Okay, David, did you hear us fine? Uh, yes, I hear you great. Okay, great. So thanks everybody for joining uh, for the um, fourth debate of this super interesting conference. And um, today we're going to address uh, an issue. I'll stop, try to stop walking around so much because that way you can put the camera on me. Um, today we're going to try to address the issue that uh, we've talked about a lot throughout the conference. Um, namely, uh, how do we get people to accept the results of uh, uh, machine learning uh, techniques? And we've got a, a very storied panel to um, address these issues, starting with Lucia here from Barcelona, Alex Refrigier, who's connected from uh, Zurich, uh, David Hogg from New York, and Fred Corbin, who's also here with us from uh, uh, Lausanne. So I'll give the floor to uh, Lucia, and we're going to do like we did um, yesterday. We're going to have uh, 10 minutes of comments and then 10 or 15 minutes of questions. Uh, Okay. Thank you, Lucia. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the organizer for organizing such an interesting and stimulating conference. So let's get going about uh, what would it take for the community, that is, people that are outside this room and this conference, to accept the finding. Uh, so here's your panel again, in case uh, you didn't hear, and of course your uh, our moderator who's gonna do okay so here's me I'm going to uh, play the devil's advocate and uh, I'm a person that knows very little about machine learning so I'm sort of uh, in a good role to play the devil's advocate and uh, uh, the, your typical cosmology plot will look something like this there are two axes with one parameter in one axis a parameter in the other axis and then some blobs or bananas which are cosmological constraints on uh, those parameters and I have to put all this there otherwise I'm gonna be in trouble with the admin all right so uh, it really depends on the question uh, uh, every, uh, every finding is always an answer to a question. And so here's the kind of questions you may be asking. Uh, what is the smallest possible error on parameter x within a given model, but you don't care whether the model is a right description of reality or not? Uh, or I'd like to understand the physical processes at play in the universe, since we are talking about cosmology and I'm, my experience is in, is, sorry, we're talking about astronomy and my experience is in cosmology. Uh, is there a sign for new physics? And is the Lambda CDM model, the concordance model that we all know, all know and love, completely correct? Uh, or I want to classify objects or I want to model my, say, instrument response which is a very important thing to do in order to get to the big question about the universe, uh, or I want to sift through a huge amount of data and find relatively rare events of interest. I may call this something like a trigger akin to a trigger. Uh, or I have a complex exact model, say in body simulation, we saw an example earlier today, uh, or you know, say stellar models, and I need a fast way to interpolate or emulate because running each of these models is very expensive. Or do I want something that works or something that actually describes an intrinsic property of nature? So again, the answer to the question and whether it's believed or not depends on the question. Uh, so uh, I want to put in front of an hypothetical case, uh, an hypothetical scenario. In 10 years or so, we, we end up with something like this, constraints that look like that. These are the two axes. You may imagine that in one axis is the equation of state uh, parameter of dark energy, and in the other one says the gravi gravitational slip. Say one is the combination H0 times sine horizon radiation drag, and the other one is omega matter H. Or say one is neutrino mass, and the other one is your favorite cosmological parameter in a standard lambda CDM model. The blue one in for this plot, it's the standard analysis. Say the standard baryon acoustic oscillation analysis, the most you know, conservative kind of way to analyze a large scale structure data set, done with compressed variable, not done with a full fit with all the nonlinearities in there. And the, uh, the, the purple, it's an alternative analysis. And for this slide, you may want to think about it's something like higher order correlation, something that goes more into the nonlinearity, but still it's a model that, that has some transparent connection with the underlying physics. 
uh, okay. And then I will change the description of alternative analysis, but the color will remain the same. So we are now going to be taking a poll or a quiz, and it's an experiment. Let's see if it works. If it works, uh, it's thanks to this wonderful support team and organizer that we have here. And if it doesn't work, it's all my fault. <laughs> I'm trying to do something a little bit too ambitious. <laughs> so you will have to give an answer. But don't dwell too much about it. Just hit the bottom. Because at the end of the, uh, of the day, we are going to talk about, you know, would you trust, would you believe the result? And this is soci sociology. I mean, it's science, yes, but there's a tiny bit of sociology there. So let's see. Question number one, and the poll uh, will be open now. The link will be put on Slack. But before you vote, l listen to me. So uh, say uh, that the uh, thin vertical lines are the lambda CDM prediction. This is a standard uh, co uh, concordance lambda CDM. The blue one is the standard analysis, and the purple is an alternative analysis, higher order, full shape, you name it, but there's still some physics, uh, some, under, some transparent connection to the physics. So the first question is, which one would you believe? But the most interesting question is, which one would the Nobel Committee believe? Because if you find anything that is really important about all this extra parameter from the Lambda CDM, it's worth a trip to Stockholm, right? So here you go. Vote. And when you are done, we move on. So I'll give you five seconds to vote. Sorry. Okay. Mike. Yeah, take a mic, uh, Karim. Okay. Uh, the right. Okay, so I'm the I'm the pool guy then. Yeah. Yeah. So don't, don't, don't think too much. Just that's way too much. A bit. We are up to 45 participants. Is is growing still? So. Okay. Let's wait. Come on, vote. Vote because we have to move on. <laughs> More vote. All right, it's getting up. 56. I don't want to bias the result. Right, nobody knows, right? Don't, uh, don't, don't worry, there are other Apart from me. No, but nobody knows what the other have, uh, have, have picked. We'll, we'll, we'll uncover it at the end. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I propose so that we that we stop okay. now. Okay. We stop. have 64 votes. Okay. And don't don't tell me the result yet. Ah, you don't want don't the result. Don't tell me the result. Oh, I need okay. to write it down then. No, no, it's going to be in the result page. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's going to be in the result, the result yeah. page. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sure. But yeah. uh, you know, I'll write it down just in case. Okay. 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 So let me go on for the with the next question. In the next question, the alternative analysis. Nothing has changed, but the alternative analysis is now on machine learning approach where you don't have a transparent connection with the underlying physics. So we can vote for this now. It's coming in. So I, I'll cut at 60 participants. And you're oh. asking what the Nobel Prize Committee would yes, believe? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's always what the Nobel Prize Committee will, will, will trust. Not but you haven't told us whether the result was produced by a PI who is female or not. Did Which you vote, David? Which relevant to the Nobel Prize Committee. D did you vote? Did you vote? Yeah, everybody has to okay. vote. Okay, uh, the vote, shall yeah. we? Uh, we wait a bit more, we're up to uh, almost to 60, so that is it's comparable with the first okay. one. Okay, all right, let's move on. Now start, uh, uh, started, how about now? So now the prediction from your beloved model lies within the standard analysis confidence contour, but the, confidence, but the constraint from the alternative model extract much more signal, because the, the contours are smaller, and they land well yeah. outside the expectation from our beloved model. Please vote. Sorry. Always a machine learning. From now on, it's always machine learning. 
whatever it's machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> it's, something, it's something that it's not the standard traditional that has been, that, you know. That, and the, the that, question is always what will the Nobel Committee believe? And the question believe? is what will the Nobel Committee believe? Huh. Well, the thing is, what would it take for the uh, finding to be accepted by the community? And I'm taking a slice of the community that is particularly conservative. Because, you know, if you, if you can convince them, then you can convince almost anybody. Okay. So that's my game. We, we're almost to 60. I propose oh, that we move to the next we one. We move yeah. to the next one. So here's the next one. Now, not only uh, the alternative machine learning model has broken the degeneracy from the standard model because it has more information, but also it lands in a different place in parameter space. And it's inconsistent with the traditional analysis. And the traditional analysis says, same old, same old. But the new one says, there's new physics there. Now cool. that's a trip to Stockholm. He's growing up. Very interesting. He's growing up quickly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> tell me when we can move on to the next I'll case. I'll tell you, he's going to be fast. Okay, we, it's, it has stabilized anyway. We should move on. We should move on. Now, it's this. So I haven't changed the, the relative uh, position of the two set of contours. But now the beloved Lambda CDM and everybody's expectation, sort of, or, well, it's uh, landing exactly on top of the alternative analysis. But the standard one, it's well away from it. Those are devilish questions. Hmm? Those are devilish questions. <laughs> I told you I was devil's advocate when yeah, I started. So the, the vertical lines are Lambda CDM. Lambda CDM. The, the thin uh, cross is the Lambda CDM prediction. St flat, concordance, standard, uh, old, boring Lambda CDM. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, agree with you. Not Jamie. exactly devil's advocate because you're, you're, this, this poll is making almost exactly the points that are, I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't devils. see your we slides. Totally <laughs> we didn't see your slides. We didn't see your slides. <laughs> I know, I hadn't made them. So I, I, it's actually <laughs> true that Alicia, Alicia and I have a lot more in common. Talk about the blind are. analysis here. Okay, let's go. All right, on. can we move on? Uh, yeah. A bit more? Yeah. Yeah, vote everybody. Noise. Please vote. Out on the internet there, you vote as well. Yeah, yeah. You have to make a choice. Yeah, don't think too much about it because at the end of the day, we all know that trust, although we are scientists and we really believe that we are you know, very rational, yeah. at the end, trust is a gut oh, there's, feeling. There's lots of other sources of, uh, of uh, bias, actually. Uh, as David says, gender, people, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, I yeah. think we are okay now. Yeah, okay, let's move on. Now I have another uh, case where uh, for one parameter, the two analyses agree, one with smaller error bar than the other one, there's a little bit of tension, but not too much. But for the other parameter, uh, one, uh, the traditional one is in agreement with the Lambda CDM, but the alternative analysis, machine learning, etc., etc., it's not. Uh, what do you think, how about now? What would the Nobel Committee believe? Huh. That's all the Nobel Committee has to decide. Yeah. Well, you can change field and give <laughs> not to cosmology to, I don't know, quantum something, yeah. <laughs> but. Okay. Uh, almost there. I mean, do we have evidence that the Nobel Prize Committee does look at anything but figure four? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, we so can move. Okay. Can we move on? Sure. And then, what did I do? Uh, are we here? Okay. The next is, should the acceptance of uh, a finding on a result depend on the agreement of the finding with preconception or expectations? What do you think? Well, that's easy. <laughs> Hank, maybe it's easy, but I bet we disagree. <laughs> See, the answer is yes or no.
How is the voting going? Almost there. So most of the votes are about uh, six, uh, 57 to uh, almost 70 participants. And there's 70 people online right now. Yeah. Uh, six, 70 people, okay. 75 online. And, and All right. I think we can stop now. Shall we, st we stop uh. the voting and let's go and... Uh. Uh. No? Don't move. I, I don't stop. Move. Everyone knows not to trust electronic polls okay. though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so, I can tell you the result Okay, now. so uh, now the question that we want the poll to tell us is whether the, does the acceptance depend on the agreement of the finding with preconception given all the uh, purple and blue question that you had before. Okay. And so let's see if we can go to the result page and see that live, if we can. Yeah, yeah. No, no, just the, the, result page, the, the result page is just the... Uh, the, uh, the cockpit page at the page where you say next slide, next slide, next slide, and, and look at the result live. So I, I wrote all of the results. You won't see anything. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when I tried before, well, you try see 0%, 0%. Zero percent, zero percent yeah, 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 that's, you that's just, uh, oh, okay, that's work. Okay. Click, click this. Click. Okay, so let's try. I did click. click. What did happen? Yeah. Did I click? What, what? what do I do? Open, open, yeah, that's this it. This one? Yeah. Ah, c'est pas dans le même anglais, c'est dans un autre anglais. Ah. It is working on a different computer. No, 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 no ready? Okay. Guillaume, you can click on it. No, but it's... It was no, working before, huh? No, but it, it's oh, working, but working in a it's different... Uh, yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Have a look at that. Yeah, so that works. In the in the fir first one, and then I have a recap later, but let's, let's go through it. There is, you know, some four... 159. In the next one, can we go? Oh, go on. Oh, here. Here. Yeah. So that's the first one, yeah. Yeah. You need, yeah, almost there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second one, it's still the same. The same. No, no, the first one still. Uh, the second uh, one. The second one has changed now. No, it has not. Yeah, it has changed because before it was 40 and 59, now it's, it's 70, 31. Yeah. Now, uh, the next one is, ooh, 83 to, uh, ooh, and now 14 to 86, and now 32 to 67, and then so we know that whether the Nobel Committee believes it or not does depend on whether the result agrees or not with the Lambda CDM. And now I don't know how to go to the next slide. Where, how do you do that? You need to click on the right part of the, huh. yeah. Where, you do not think that the acceptance of the finding should depend <laughs> on the result agreement with your expectation. So I think, <laughs> I think I made my point here. So let me go on with the rest of the talk. Yeah. Which require clicking on it. Does it require clicking on it? How, how do you have to get to that, that other anglais. How do you do it? Yeah, you click on the, uh, on the tab. The tab, yeah. Magic. So this was the summary, and this is your result. So here it is. So what would it take for the community to accept the finding? We know that if the finding is in agreement with the expectation, it's easier for the community to accept it, but we know that we are scientists. This should not be the case, because you may miss, actually, some new physics. However, independently of the outcome, but especially if the outcome is new physics, what every physicist wants to see is extraordinary claim require extraordinary evidence. So wants to see the evidence, wants to understand what you have actually seen. Is, so, there, is there life in ML? Sorry? So, <coughs> in the, so, things that can go into this list, and it's not exhaustive, and I hope that in the discussion we can put more things there, things like explain exactly how the machine learning was used. One thing is to sift through a large amount of data 
do triggers or interpolation. And another thing, or classification, which would otherwise be impossible, and another thing is to substitute uh, the end-to-end -end process, and that gives you that, that black box feeling that makes it more difficult to, be, to trust the result. Then explain what is the feature that the machine learning technique picks up that the other ab approach doesn't, and explain what is the physical meaning of that, of that feature and how it connects with your underlying theory for fundamental physics or nature or et cetera. And convince uh, that uh, the use of the machine learning was within the boundary of the training set and not had to extrapolate widely, and then a convincing error budget. And there were quite a few talks about having a convincing error, error budget and how to get there. So I'm going towards my conclusion. So I want to uh, go back to what is a feature. So the first exercise that anybody that takes a course in machine learning does, and I know because I took the first class of a machine learning <laughs> class, and that's the first class, and I didn't go much beyond that, is uh, recognizing numbers from you know, somebody uh, scribbling the numbers and then see it as an actual digit. And then I did that in this uh, interactive uh, web page. So I wrote a two, and it goes through this uh, network, and it captured the feature. But uh, if you know, when you go through the feature, right, this feature, are they a two? What are they? I mean. We can't, we can't interpret them. And then I did the other exercise to cancel bits and pieces of that two and see at what point the machine will not recognize it anymore as a two. So at this level, it says it's a two first guess and the second guess it's a one. But then if I erase only a little bit, which for us is still a two, the machine says the first guess is a six, the second guess is zero, and the feature that it picks up, to me, they look still the same as in the other case where the system was right. So anyway. Uh, so how to get there? Um, I think there is need a good track record of the machine learning technique to outperform the standard analysis uh, on a validation and a subset of the data where the subset is so that the standard analysis in the full sample has a similar error bar as the alternative analysis on the subset. So you can test it. And no, only simulation is not good enough. You need to do it on the real data. Perform, uh, perform the machine learning analysis on cuts of the data that capture more of the known or less of the unknown physics, and then see how it behaves and if it's under control. A good track record in terms of coverage of the declared error bars on data and full PDF, and there were talks about that. A clear demonstration of robustness to change in the training set and other choices in the model, in the machine learning model I'm talking about and building physical understanding into the model. There were a lot of talks about that. And maybe one can softly impose, impose physics, let's say symmetry, in the ML approach if you can't inbuild it directly into the system. And maybe some uh, blind analysis. And I'll see if I can tell you some words about that if I have time. If not, we'll skip go, go, it. We'll go a bit faster. Yep. <laughs> OK. So uh, better start now, because if you want to build up a good track record, you need years, and you need first to be in the condition of actually build a track record. So, you know, uh, 10 years in this sense go relatively fast. And so, yeah, one we other We should approach. really move on. To, we've yeah. already spent 20 minutes okay. now, so we need Let's to go on to somebody so, else. So, uh, stre stress test the machine learning approach. Yeah. That's my approach. And one option could be do bl blinding. So, there is a program to develop. And besides what I mentioned, there's surely more that can and should be done so that the community accept the finding. But so there were a lot of ideas, but not a systematic program. And mm. we should probably you know, sit down and write what the systematic program should be so that if every test of the systematic program is passed, then all parties, including the Nobel Committee, agrees that then the answer is believable. And please share your thought of what should go into this program in the discussion. And I'm always interested in your thought of what type of questions are better suited to different approaches. Anyway. That's super interesting. So I'd just like to go back before we have some, maybe some quick questions. Go back to your slide of um, where there was just a single tick mark on the page about where we were today with machine learning. Um, and then I'd ask you to, uh, to go the slide before that, before that. Yeah, so um, uh, where are we here today with the, for you between 1 and 100%? So there is, 
just like there as, is a, as green, a single There figure. is a green thing there because I think nobody, even the more but conservative so, yeah. people, would yeah. ever object that yeah. if you do things like that, uh, that, like that second bullet point, I don't think anybody will object, not even yeah. the bastion of conservatism <laughs> yeah, in so our field. For you cu currently, how confident are you that those things exist in the machine learning community? Uh, what, 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 what do you mean? Everything on your slide. Everything on my slides. Yeah. I think there's a lot of work going on into that direction, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily mean that this work has gone beyond that community and has convinced the other community. And, uh, and so uh, are you convinced personally? <laughs> I think it depends on the application. Application okay. by application. <laughs> Pol politicians answer. Yes. Okay. But I, I don't agree with what Leisha just said, that everyone would be happy at that classification stage because it's precisely the triggers that you cannot go back to. And when people are measuring, you know, if you look at the LHC looking for a second Higgs, say, second Higgs will appear as a as a peak somewhere and in energy, in transverse energy or something, or something, Mandelstam variables or something. And then if if the triggers are overly sensitive to something there because of some quirk of the machine learning, um, then that will pass all the way through, background estimates will become wrong, and it would be very hard to unravel that. So I actually don't agree that if you put the machine learning, if you only have the machine learning there, that you're safe. I don't think that's even close to true. But, but you can test it. I mean, you don't just put it there blindly. You, you can test it. The um, thing is that- the in the LHC, you cannot test it very easily. They, they can only upgrade occasionally and they can only do different um, they only get a few chances to do different kinds of triggers. If machine learning was inside the trigger, yeah. there's no going back and finding out what you would have gotten if you'd had a different trigger. Uh, it would be incredibly expensive. But the, the normal committee did believe them. <laughs> so ah, that and got interestingly, the LHC did not use, neither Atlas nor CMS used machine learning inside the fundamental mm. triggers. There was machine, some machine learning used in some aspects of the model, but not at the trigger stage, I think precisely for this reason. Uh, Alex, uh, do you have some comments on what you've heard so far? So, thanks. That was very interesting, Licia. As I'll explain a bit later, I'm uh, more on the optimistic side, so I will give a, a different perspective. I have also some reserve and skepticism, but I'll, I'll tell you uh, my more optimistic approach. So I don't know if it's the angel's advocate, but we'll see. Okay. Um, uh, Fred, do you want to say something? No, so, um, I think actually what I will, what I will, will say later is <clears throat> mostly about how to check machine learning works. Yeah. I think it's probably the main bottleneck, including in classifying objects among tons, tons of data. Okay. So the simplest machine learning task. Okay. So I think we'll move on and we'll hear from, Question. well, we'll take the, I prefer to take the questions after hearing from, uh, De, is it you, Ben? <laughs> okay, Some, somebody pass that man a microphone. I uh, just had a quick question about, the, about your poll, because you didn't have an option where everything agrees with each other, but the machine learning result has bigger error bars than the, than the classical one. That's a regime that we've been in for a while, for example, with BAO detection, uh, yeah. where we've tried to reproduce that with Borg and so forth, and we've we never found the BAOs. Um, and we were quite suspicious about the kinds of choices that were made in the traditional analyses um, for, for quite a long while. That's yeah, just to support that comment, it, if, if the machine learning is being used to make certain kinds of nuisance parameters more flexible, it will often have the case of expanding the error bar. Or not assume Gaussian minus, minus there, minus yeah. yeah, or not assume Gaussian likelihoods when you're learning the likelihoods using uh, likelihood-free inference or simulation-based inference. Okay. Um, I propose we go on to listen to David now, so please uh, tell us what you think. Um, Hank, can you quit out of my of the presentation and rejoin? Because I was editing slides up to like one minute before, and I think it might be just it, Google Docs might need to just update. No, I think it's, it should update automatically, actually. Okay. So you want fine. us to show the slides from here? Yeah, can you just show the slides? Yeah, no, 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 no. 
Sh can I make Kareem go next slide? You share, next them yourself. slide. you share them yourself. It's better, actually. Uh, experience okay, I'll share. Taught it. Us. Just, second, just yeah. take me a second. Yeah, just, just share it from your slide side. Yeah, it's better like that. Oh, cool. <laughs> that's, my Zoom. that's my Zoom. It's not my fault. Uh, where is it? Here. OK. Yeah. Present. Yeah, that's better, because we can see you when you do that, in fact. Ah, uh, good, I see. Oh, no, here we are. OK, okay good. good. So there's the end of Leisha. I really like what uh, Leisha said. I, I agree very strongly with the things she said. I don't agree with the poll recipients who said that you should trust the results independent of whether or not they agree with expectations because expectations come from previous data. Like, does everyone in this room believe both the CMB value for H naught and the HST value for H naught? You're not allowed to believe both at the same time. Well, actually you are if you want to modify the cosmological model. But I think most of us believe that there's truly gonna be an H naught and the fact that there's a disagreement is important and a reason to, to subject both measurements to skepticism. So, so I don't actually agree we should accept things independent of that skepticism context. Um, uh, uh, and it relates to that Sagan quote. But anyway, I really like Leisha's introduction and I'm basically gonna say some of the same things, uh, but I'll be fast. One thing is, when we make a surprising discovery, how do we verify it? it? Just in general, forget about machine learning, how do we verify discovery? I'm not gonna answer that question because it's a big question, but it does involve going back into the pieces and asking whether the pieces pass kind of unit tests and functional tests. And by unit tests and functional tests, I'm talking like code, but I really mean those are physical tests. Um, and I remember, you know, when we were doing the, when we did the discovery of the Baryon acoustic feature uh, in that paper in 2005, we were asking questions about like, does this project onto our selection function and things like that. Um, it's a hard problem and it took us a lot of work. It was quite easy to make the plot with this little bump, but it was very hard to decide that it was worth publishing. Um, now, the, uh, the, the, um, so for, an ex for example, imagine you made a surprising, so I used the word, whoops, I used the word surprising on my first slide, like because of course you might not make surprising discoveries, but then I'm not that interested. Um, so uh, the, the question for me is, does putting machine learning somewhere in the loop, either very early, like in calibration of your device, which is kind of the place where I'm thinking about machine learning, or very late, like, um, using it as an emulator for the cosmological simulations that you use to compare the theory against, um, does that make the verification easier or harder? I think that generically it makes it harder because generically we do not have uh, unit tests or on whole machine learning methods or functional tests for whole machine learning methods. So generically, I think things get harder when we put in complex models whose behaviors we don't understand. Another way to think about it, if you want to use Bayesian language, is that we don't understand what is the prior that's implicitly being put in on those nuisances when the nuisances are being handled by machine learning methods or things like that. And Leisha mentioned symmetries and things, and I think that's very important. I might forget to talk about that, but it's very relevant, I think, in this. Um, so, you know, one example is if you have a cosmological, if you've used machine learning to emulate cosmology and use that as your simulations instead of a suite of simulations, because you say, oh, we're doing Euclid, we can't afford to do the full simulation, so we're doing these emulations. And then we get some weird results where the world disagrees from, from the simulations in certain ways. Do we believe that? Well, you might say, well, we could check it by then doing the full simulations, but if we have to do that, maybe we should do the full simulations from the beginning. Anyway, it's a thing to think about there. Um, and of course, we might make no very surprising discoveries. And I have to say, maybe I'll offend people in the room by saying that I actually think machine learning, like deep machine learning things in astrophysics and cosmology have not yet made very surprising discoveries. Um, and if we haven't made very surprising discoveries with machine learning, okay, well, maybe then we can trust it all. But, but first of all, then we're triggering everyone's thinking like, why should the amount we verify things depend on how surprising things are, which is people what, exactly what Alicia was kind of bringing up. Um, but also I would be very sad if we put all this time into machine learning and cosmology and we got nothing. 
of interest, like an extra decimal place on the matter density. Um, uh, another relevant thing, just very, very technical matter, which might sound overly inside baseball, but highly overparameterized models are susceptible to adversarial attacks. And what I mean by that is when you have a highly overparameterized model and you have a finite training set, it's almost always the case that there are unconstrained degrees of freedom, unidentifiable parameters, if you like, if you're a statistician, inside that model. And that means you can do funny things to your data that will change your answers. In fact, you can even put in really unphysical things in for your data and change your answers. Does that have any implications for belief and verifiability? And I think it does. So I've been thinking a lot about stellar spectroscopy. I work on, I've made some methods which you might call machine learning, but they're more like linear regressions that I we use in um, stellar spectroscopy and in exoplanet finding and things like that. And so imagine you're doing stellar spectroscopy and you've built a beautiful machine learning method that can tell you the potassium abundance of every star in your sample. Um, now, you can corrupt a spectrum, you add a tiny bit of not even conceivably relevant noise into your, your input object, and all of a sudden it dramatically changes the potassium abundance. Maybe even the noise you put in isn't even near the potassium features that are in your spectrum, and it changes your potassium abundance. That is generic. That You might say, oh, well, then you've got some crap. But actually, this will be true of every machine learning method that is being used. If you have a 42-layer ReLU network in your system, you definitely have this happening. This is a generic thing. Um, so now then you can ask the question, are you really measuring the potassium abundance? Even if you pass all your validation and test um, questions, the fact that you are adversarially attackable, I think is relevant. And this hasn't been looked at very much in cosmology and astrophysics yet, but I think it's very relevant to us. I think at least at the conceptual level, many people would say if these attacks work, then the measurements are somehow off the rails. And it relates to this thing where you, which you've probably seen where there's a picture of a panda and then they add a tiny bit of noise and the machine learning method says it's a given or whatever. Um, uh, I think that verifying important discoveries is challenging even at the best of times. And one example I would give you that I, I, I talk about a lot in my work is we're trying to find very, very small planets. You know, you're trying to find an Earth sized planet uh, around a sun like star, um, and it's going at like a 300 day orbit or whatever. There's a few candidates out there in TESS and Kepler. Well, Kepler really more than TESS, but let's call it Kepler. Um, if you look at those, they, they are, there are very low signal to noise objects that are very hard to observe. And now you ask, do you really believe that that planet is there? Well, right now, the only way to verify it is build another Kepler that's bigger and stare at it longer with better noise. Like there's no really external way to verify it. And if we add like machine learning layers to this, I don't think it makes our life uh, any better. Anyway, that's all I want to say. I just wanted to say that the problem is hard. I think it's hard even without machine learning. And then with machine learning, I don't think we really have approaches. Thank you, David, for those very interesting remarks. Would the panel like to uh, respond, Licia? Sorry, yeah, I've got your microphone. So you are even more pessimistic than I am. How is that? <laughs> And I work in this business. <laughs> Maybe that's why. <laughs> oh, by the way, I wanted to say something about symmetries because you mentioned it. One of the things, one of the reasons we're, so I'm working on some work recently about how you exactly encode physical symmetries and we are thinking about this. And one of the reasons is adversarial attacks because you can destroy a lot of adversarial attacks by imposing symmetries because then at least the inputs have to respect the symmetry or the, the relationships you're modeling have to respect symmetry. So I actually do think that symmetries is a little window into a possible future that might be good. Anyway, I just wanted to say that because you triggered me when you said that. Alex, uh, would you like to add something? Yeah, this is, these are very good remarks. And I, I think it's, uh, and, and both Lisha and you are raising some very important um, points. I want to maybe bounce on one of them, which is the, the, the caution you put on putting machine learning early. And I agree that one needs to be cautious with that, especially if you use machine learning also afterwards, but even for uh, an, uh, you know, a, a classical analysis afterwards, because as you said, you, have, you can have some built-in priors or some uh, distortions. Uh, and so having 
the full physics uh, at the early stages and I think using the machine learning at the end, I think is a, is a safer approach because then we can use more Monte Carlo approach to test, to test all of this. Yeah, yeah that, that's an insightful remark. And I, think, and I think if you look at the way people use the data sets that I've produced, you know, the, uh, the, the SDSS catalogs and things like that, people tend not to go all the way back to the raw pixels and reanalyze. And that means that those low level decisions you make are not just hard to analyze, but also kind of infecting thousands of projects, not just your own key science. Yeah. So I agree. Yeah. But uh, in, in SDSS, I mean, you know, all these assumptions were tested and were tested how, what is the impact of changing slightly this assumption into the final result. So yes, this, this kind of internal consistency checks needs to be done for any step that has not a guidance from first principle, like symmetries, I say. It's a comment about reproducible yeah, science. That's a very good point. And, that, and actually, that's an interesting thing, because one of the ways to kind of phrase my concern is that the space in which that, uh, those checks have to happen may have just gotten much larger when you're using your 42-layer ReLU network. Um, Fred, do you have a comment? Yeah, going in, in the same direction, I think you can't really di distinguish between you know, machine learning techniques, inputs, and training sets. So it's going in more or less in the same direction. You can break any machine learning algorithm by putting the wrong inputs or putting the wrong labels. Even a few la wrong labels are sufficient when you supervise machine learning to, to break everything down. And people tend to forget this. So it's very easy to do you know, misuse of, of machine learning, even if in the first place the tool is good. Yeah. You're here. You're here. There's a related question on the Slack, David, um, uh, which is more or less what we've said. Why do Adversarial attacks matter if you require reproducibility from independent models, ML or otherwise. Right. I mean, I think the relationship between adversarial attacks and these things are a little complicated. The reason I'm interested in adversarial attacks, and maybe it's off topic here, but I, the, they're interesting to me because they reveal the wrongness of the model. Yep. It's not so much that you can't you don't like you might be able to demonstrate that you haven't been poisoned by the attack like that the attack didn't directly affect your actual results um but that doesn't quite remove the uncertainty it brings you because the the, the existence of the adversarial attack suggests that something else is wrong in your system that's kind of more what i'm thinking but i have to say i i don't have a theory of it yet but, uh, but for, i am actually for the adver now. adversarial attack it's quite a loaded language i mean it's like there was there's some bad person polluting your data. <laughs> right, and I'm just yeah. assuming that that bad person yes. is the, the universe. universe itself, but yeah. yeah. Is there <laughs> some, oh, do we have some questions in the amphi here at the EFP? Behind the lamp? No. Okay, it's super interesting, but time is pressing. And I think we should go on and listen to Alex now. Thank you, David. Okay, all right. Let me try and share my screen. Can you see this? Yep. Okay. Very good. So yes, yeah, so I will give a, um, a slightly more optimistic approach, which is good to, to continue the, the discussion. But first, I of course want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this panel and also uh, for the, the very interesting uh, conference and, and a very timely uh, conference. So the, what I will focus on is cosmological inference. And, and this is what uh, Alicia and, and, and David were, were discussing before, but let me summarize a bit and then see wh where we stand. Uh, can you see my arrow, actually? Can you see my pointer? Everything is fine, yes, we see the pointer. Yeah, okay, very good. So the idea is that we want to start from some cosmological data. I will be using weak lensing maps as an, as an example. So this would be a map, it's a, co a complex data set and then we want to infer cosmological constraints, right? And what we're discussing is the comparison between the classical approach, which consists of having a human uh, to define a statistics, let's say it could be a two point function, a power spectrum, and then using a likelihood analysis, uh, assuming we can have a tractable likelihood and then derive cosmological constraints. This is what we're used to. This is what 
we, 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 we've done until recently. And then we want to replace that by, uh, we want to replace this step by a machine, right? So we want to train a machine using a lot of forward modeling simulations, train it, give it the real data set and ask the machine, tell, give us the, the constraint. That's what we, we're trying to do. And when you think about it, it's amazing what we're trying to do because we're trying to replace humans for a task which is very high level. We're not asking for replace humans on a, on a, on a low level task. This is, this is expert knowledge that we, scientific expert knowledge that we're in the process of, of replacing. So it's, it's extremely ambitious and it's amazing that we are even talking about it and, and that there are results on this. Now, just, just as an example, again, I was gonna use the weak lensing analysis. So this is the a mass map of the DES uh, Y3. Um, which is a, a projected mass of, of, uh, of, the, of the density field in the, in the universe. And the classical analysis consists of uh, applying a, a known a statistics, like, as I said, human-made. In this case, it's a two-point function, the correlation functions. And then applying that uh, using a, doing a likelihood analysis, as I said, and that works really well. Uh, there's now a lot of results. There's also other surveys. Uh, and you see, for example, constraints on this uh, sigma eight and omega m, the amplitude of the matter power spectrum and the amount of, uh, the, of, of matter in the universe. And we get constraints, we can compare to other data sets. And I think we all come to, to trust this analysis. This is, they're, very, they're, they're very involved. There's a lot of checks of systematics, uh, but this is our, this is our classical, uh, classical approach. Now, something intermediate to the, to the full machine learning approach um, which is uh, what Alicia alluded to in one of the questions that she had uh, to the audience is, let me see if I can, yeah, would be to use a, 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 a still a human-made statistics, but in which the likelihood may not be tractable or we may not have even a, a, a analytic prediction that we can use to compare to the measurement of the summary statistics and then uh, infer the cosmological parameters. So one example is peak counting. So the idea is to try to, uh, to gather non-Gaussian information in these maps. So we have, there's more information than the two point function. So we try to characterize it by counting peaks. This is a, just a recent result that was uh, one of my PhD students just posted in AstroPH with the, from the DES collaboration. And we see uh, again on this plane, so if you can focus on this uh, corner here, you see sigma eight omega m, the same parameters. In blue, you see the result from the two point function. And in orange that you see below, you see the results from the peak analysis, which captures information beyond the two point function. Of course, you can combine the two in the green and get even more uh, stronger constraints. Now that's a much harder analysis. This requires uh, either going beyond the uh, likelihood, it requires a lot of forward simulation to predict the signals in a given, in a given model. And, and that again, uh, one can have, um, it, it's more involved, it's also much heavier uh, computationally. And also in terms of understanding and trust, uh, you would have to um, put more faith in, this, in the forward simulations in order to understand, to, under, to, to, to believe this, because again, there's no analytical model or semiological model we can use to make the prediction. And then the next step, of course, is to do uh, machine learning. So this is another graduate student, the results from analysis of a weak lensing map from the kids uh, for 50 survey. Uh, these are tomographic maps. And what, what, uh, what he did is he applied uh, a machine learning the convolutional neural networks on these maps trained on a very large array of n-body forward simulations on which a lot of systematics were uh, applied and tested. And you see in blue, again, in this omega m sigma eight plane, you see in blue, the constraint from the machine learning and in green, the constraint from the two point function alone. And you see that the, um, the, the, they're, in, they're consistent, but the, two, the, the machine uh, constraint from the machine learning are tighter than the one from the two point function. And there the, the scales have been matched by the way in, the, in this case, which means that the, uh, the, the, the machine learning algorithm has managed to capture more information than the two point function, which is quite, quite extraordinary. The, 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 the human made statistic, which was the peak analysis also could do it, but here this is done by a machine learning algorithm. So to, to give a perspective here, I think we have uh, quite, a, quite a lot of progress in this area, moving from a likelihood analysis of a summary statistics for which we have analytical prediction and a tractable likelihood to the next step, which is 
non-Gaussian summary statistics, which are more complicated, which may not have attractive likelihood, which requires a lot of forward modeling, uh, for example, like, like, uh, like peak counts to the full machine learning, uh, to the full machine uh, approach. But I think we've made a lot of progress. I think it's, it's working. Um, and it has, in particular, a high potential to extract non-Gaussian information, which may be uh, difficult to extract from uh, human-made statistics. Human may have a difficulty extracting all the information, especially when it comes to, to extracting non-Gaussian, very weak non-Gaussian correlations and patterns in complex uh, data with complex formats. So I would say for inference with machine learning, uh, there's a lot of strong argument for it. When it has to be done very carefully, it has to be done well. Um, but the, the thing to see is that even though the machine learning part at the end of the analysis in this case and the inference part can be seen as a black box, but it doesn't mean that there's no physics in the analysis. It's just that we're transferring the physics from an analytical prediction of a human-made statistics to the physics we put in the forward modeling simulations. And that's where the physics is. So there's, there's, there's and, and it's much heavier computationally, but doesn't mean that we don't put in the physics in the simulations. A related, uh, aspect is, of course, interpret interpretability, which was discussed in the conference. Uh, of course, if we could get the machine learning algorithm to tell the humans what it understood, we would feel a lot better. And in fact, that's one of the discomfort we have with machine learning is that it changes the way we do science. We think we used to uh, saying that science is, a, is un it's, it, we want to understand, we want the, our humans to understand where the, the physics is coming from and all that we have to get used to putting the physics in the forward modeling simulations. It also puts more, much more, but it's difficult to get interpretable uh, machine learning so uh, algorithms, so that may not be necessarily possible. It also puts more uh, weight or more need on a thorough tests of, of robustness to systematics because we, uh, we intervene less and we have less uh, intuition on the step from the data to the, uh, to the parameters we're estimating. So one needs a lot of more thorough tests of systematics, put them in the simulations, see whether the results change. But at least from the forward modeling point of view, one can do that in a very rigorous, in a very rigorous fashion. And, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the, the standard analysis, even though we, we're used to them, they're also very complex and also humans make mistakes. So it's not like they're also magical either. And, and overall, uh, it's also very important to do blinded analysis, actually for all of these analysis, including the, the classical approach, uh, the standard approach, uh, in order to avoid any kind of biases that was uh, discussed before in Lisha's, uh, Lisha's talk. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> would anyone like to respond? I think Lisha is going to respond because her... Uh... <laughs> okay. Uh, David, are you convinced? Yeah, I have. I do have some comments actually. I really that, so that was great, Alexander, and I and I and I really like that. I like making this very concrete with the kind of Euclid style plans that we're thinking about, and and I, I love the fact that you're actually suggest I, that you really explicitly said we're going to replace the humans, which is great. I'm glad. Um, uh, but, that was uh, a bit provocative. To be um, but. Uh, but I would say one of the things that was interesting about this relates back to symmetries. One of the things that's so interesting is that the humans chose statistics that obey very strict symmetries. The correlation function and the higher point functions involving these triangles and so on are designed to be rotationally and translationally and scale invariant in all sorts of important ways. And so putting those kinds of invariances into the models, I think, are going to is going to help a lot. And uh, the other thing that you triggered me a little bit on, which I just wanted to emphasize, is this idea of interpretability. And I would say even more important than interpretable is really explainable. Mm -hmm. Explainability. Yes. You want to be able to say, here's what the machine learning method did and why. And I think, again, I have this little intuition that symmetries might help us with that because because then you will be able to see what group operations are actually entering into the machine yep. learning so I agree with both. I think symmetries is, is super interesting. Uh, and in fact, one can do either test a posteriori to see whether it understood the symmetry. You can also do it at the data representation level to make sure that you can either help the network uh, to use the symmetry because there's a lot of information which is not really needed. For example, homogeneity and isotropy, for example. Now, if you help it, of course, then it's gone. You can't use it as a test. 
or you can use it as a test. And it's very interesting to think of data representation um, in, in, in that way. And your second point was? I'm just saying that explainability. Uh, explainability, yeah. It's been it's, more important than interpretability yeah, so, in some yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, explainability, of course, would be, would be great because then we could learn it and understand better and give us more confidence. I'm not, I don't know so much about it, but from what I understand, there are some uh, convolutional neural network that can, that can also give uh, this interpretability feature. But they're, 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 they're very constrained compared to the, to the other ones. And I think it's, a, it's an ongoing field of research, uh, but that would, be, that would go a long way. Just I mean, one just way we interrupt. would absolutely believe the results is if yeah. the machine learning method ran and then it said, hey, peeps, I figured out how you do this. You do this statistic yeah. here and you do that statistic on these scales and you do this statistic on those scales and you'll get this answer. And then we could literally go and write separate yes. code that did that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, everyone we, would then understand yeah. and agree with the result. We play a bit with it, so you can get some networks to tell you, you know, where most of the sensitivity came from from these maps, and it, it indeed kind of picks up peaks and troughs, and which which is close to what the humans have chosen. The peak count is one of the strongest constraints you can get on non Gaussian, but it's still quite difficult to interpret. I mean, this is thing we did some time ago, so maybe in the meantime there's been more. Because you still have to, the representation inside the, the, the network is very complicated. In fact, that's the, that's the whole point. So how do you, <laughs> do you extract, it's a bit like looking into, I mean, you may understand it, for example, like the, the, you may understand it. How do I look into your brain to understand it? You have to, you have to translate it for me into you know, a linear thing. And it's not because you understand it that you can explain it to me well, right? <laughs> did, you, did you have a comment? Yeah, so I wanted to make a, a little bit of an historical parallel, uh, which goes along the line of a discussion we were having a coffee break. I mean, remember, uh, when we have a real conference, we can have coffee break and actually talk to people? Yeah. <laughs> which is... The, I hate the, all of you all. I hate you. Yeah, I, I, sorry I couldn't come. That sounds really good. <laughs> well, I'm, I'll tell you now. Uh, so it's the, the, the parallel with the development of antibody simulations to you know, study the, the, the growth of large scale structure. So uh, at, at, in the first attempt to do that, then the, the question was, you know, how do we know that the machine does exactly what the universe does? And then the community actually made an effort of actually setting down a series of tests that the simulation mm -hmm. had to pass. One of them, it's energy conservation, even though it's not always perfect, that every approximation that gets introduced, because of course approximation needs to be introduced, are not important to the final answer. And so, so this is a little bit similar. It, at the beginning it seemed like a black box, but then it was understood what physics is there, what it's uh, exact, what is approximated, what type of approximation, what are the limit of validity, and uh, so maybe we can sort of learn from that thought process and reapply, but we obviously changing what needs to be changed. Good point. Yeah, yeah I think it's a very interesting perspective. I completely agree. In fact, it reminds me of a coffee conversation we had in Lausanne this year a long time ago. <laughs> but it's also another historical perspective is is coming from the, the evolution of cosmology because until recently and still now, a lot of the information that we get on our, on our cosmic model come from the CMB. And it took already a long time to learn how to work on the Gaussian spherical map. And, 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 and at, at first we didn't know how to do it, at least fast enough, and then the community learned and now we're very convinced. But a lot of our methods are coming from the CMB analysis, which is a single map, single experiment, and mostly Gaussian. And now we're moving to the regime where a lot of the, uh, the, the, the lot of the information will be coming more and more from large scale structure surveys. And we're getting precision comparable to the CMB. We're kind of in the, in the transition. Of course, the comparison will be fantastic. But there we have to use completely different technique because the signal is non-Gaussian, multi-experiment, and very large, large uh, data sets that we have, to, we have to combine. And that's why these uh, sometimes the, the, we, 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 we reach the limit of this likelihood approach. We just can't write down the likelihood. Already in the CMB, it's quite complicated, uh, still feasible. And also uh, trying to capture this non-Gaussian information in the most um, optimal way uh, becomes more and more relevant. And, and that's why we have to also learn, maybe it'll take another decade to, to do this with, for the large scale structure surveys. Um, fine. Is there, are there any comments from the audience? Yeah, there's one here, so just state your name and maybe take off the mask so people can hear you. I'm Si Hao Chang. Uh, yeah, I think I have a comment for uh, David. Uh, the, the, I think the second transform 
uh, and some other uh, kind of CNN inspired uh, statistical tool are very close to what uh, you, you wanted. I mean, you mean in terms of encoding symmetries? Right, right, and also kind of the 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 different mathematics used in uh, complex neural net, for example, the iteration of of uh, hierarchical scales, and also the the, the uh, conservative nonlinearity versus like instead of polynomial nonlinearity, and yeah, something like that. But yeah, well, I that's mean, what I, I'm working I, on. yeah. <laughs> I do think that the structure of the network is a really important thing, and we've been and one of the oh. that, like in my mathematical the mathematical side of my research these days has been about how you could restructure networks oh, to be even more symmetric. Yes, yes, I, I think I agree. Like what Ben said yesterday is basically the the some a lot of knowledge is from the structure of the neural networks, and that can be kind of mathematically expressed and rebuilt. Um, yes. Do we have some more questions from the audience? Uh, would anyone in the panel like to further comment? Uh, Hirani is just, um, Hirani Apiris has got a comment on the Slack. It says, uh, I think building in physical symmetries into ML only partially addresses the challenges. The data model will break those in almost every problem. I, I love that question. We, uh, that is exactly why we're thinking about symmetries because, because the part of the question, when, if you're thinking about symmetry, you know that certain aspects of a physical problem, at least, I mean, we're unusual. Most parts of machine learning don't have exact symmetries. Symmetries are weakly mm -hmm. broken. But in cosmology and astrophysics, there are places that where we have truly exact symmetries, like a LIGO event has a whole set of absolutely exact symmetries. But of course, as Haranya says, every observed system has weakly or sometimes even strongly broken symmetries. Like we've studied homogeneity in the universe and to study homogeneity, it's all about studying the selection effects in the survey. You don't just see the homogene homogeneity immediately. So I think I agree with Haranya completely but I'm still interested in exact symmetries because if we're going to learn things, it, if we're going to be able to insert the machine learning into the parts of the problem appropriately, we might be able to insert them where the symmetries are actually true, or we might want to break the, the symmetries in a controlled way. Uh, anyway, I, that comment is, that, yeah, that's exactly where it's at. And that's why I think this whole area of Machine learning is interesting. Uh, there's a question with the man behind the light. <laughs> Please go ahead, Ben. So um, I was going to just emphasize or enlarge upon what David said about um, about the complexity issue. Um, I mean, even standard analyses are very complex. Uh, so that's not the only thing. Um, and in fact, uh, Leach's historical analogy to n-body simulations, I think, is um, is illuminating because also there because um, you know how long have people uh, pushed perturbative analyses to figure out the power spectrum in the mildly nonlinear regime or you know and um, that you know is that is that complex is that not complex I mean all those papers decades of work um, <laughs> I mean. You could say it's, an, it's analytics, so it's all, you know, I mean, but actually it's pretty complicated and a lot of mistakes were made and fixed and, and so forth, right? And initially, I'm sure the n-body simulations were tested against perturbative results. Uh, then at some point, I'm sure, I, I, I know that it switched yeah. over, uh, the perturbative results, and I'm sure, and then, and then the next step is, I think a lot of interesting perturbative, like resummation techniques, for example, would never have been done if you couldn't look at the n-body simulation and see, oh, um, it's changed. You know, it's, it's changed it's, around it's now. You do see a suppression yeah. at some scale. You know, there's especially the yeah. So, um, so that, I, you know, we'll probably see something similar in this context. There's a question here. I, I couldn't agree more with Wandel there. It's such an interesting thing, but there is an important difference. So it's absolutely true that all the analyses involved in cosmology are outrageously complex. And, and I do remember those early days of n-body simulations where nobody believed anything. And 
Um, and I've seen those resummations happen and people get closer with, with closed form things, but that doesn't really mean they're simple. But there is a slight difference in the sense that we do think that with these theoretical models like n-body simulations, we do believe that there is a limit you could write down in which the simulation exactly obeys a certain equation. And for most machine learning methods that people are being discussing, maybe not all, but most, there is no such limit and there isn't, no, there's no, uh, there would be no uh, like fundamental test uh, for many things that people are looking at, I think. I might be wrong, but I think. Karine, yeah, go, going back to your remark, Ben, I, I, I disagree slightly. I mean, uh, the analogy is not perfect for, for N-body simulation. You know how to write the physics, you know, you write it down, you know that the N-body is just doing a, a complex uh, integral that you don't know to do by hand. And, and what you're looking for are different approximations, and you want to test those approximations. There are limit cases that you can compute. There are lots of things which are... The, 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 Underlying physics is, is pretty clear, and you know uh, you, you know what it is. It's a very different with uh, with machine learning, where uh, there is no physics in every step. It's a uh, it's it's a very different case. I mean, I agree that there are some analogies, but clearly here, I'm not sure it's a perfect image. I mean, you're just expressing, I would say, um, the the point that has been made a couple of times, uh, which is that uh, machine learning, you want to be sure that you understand the problem that you're solving. Once you understand the problem that you're solving, machine learning and especially deep learning uh, is about writing, out an writing, in, writing down an optimization problem mm. in such a way that the solution to that optimization problem is the thing you want. Right? Now, whether after that it's just engineering, of course, <laughs> I mean, uh, it, but it's engineering in the same way as writing, you know, figuring out complicated perturbation analyses is engineering once you've understood the problem. So yeah. I mean, so that's a, it's you're you're calling for machine learning to be done in a way that uh, where the problem is well specified and hopefully actually has a limit. You know, you could think of machine learning just as a as an, a way to do variational analysis, like um, because it's solving optimization so, problems. Uh, ben, to be clear, I perfectly agree with your last point. I mean, uh, it, it's a tool we know to test the tool, uh, but but I disagree with your analogy that it's the same procedure that what happened with with uh, embodied simulation where. The, uh, we, we went from uh, fully analytics to uh, N-body being used to uh, uh, find approximation and improve the, the semi-analytical model. It's not exactly what's happening in machine learning. It's, uh, I would say, this different thing. But then, indeed, we understand a lot of it. We understand a lot of the tool. We can write, it, uh, can write uh, uh, mathematics of it. Uh, and I agree with you that it's uh, when you know what question you're asking and make sure that you're not getting, getting out of the question and write it in terms of probability, for example. Yeah, it's a very powerful tool. I, I don't disagree with that. Lucia, last point. S since I, I brought up the analogy, let me uh, specify analogy. how I meant the analogy. The analogy is that to get the community to actually believe the result of the end body, even to the point that they calibrate the analytic on it. There was a coordinated planned program to actually go through steps so that everybody step by step got mm. convinced there were different groups, they did convergence study, they changed approximation. Now, if you change from end body simulation to machine learning, you can't do the same step, but the kind of process, it's probably gonna be the same. You set up ahead a set of tests, measurable uh, you know, uh, quantity that needs to be achieved, and you go through it, and different group do it, and you agree ahead of time what will be a sufficient condition, and so in that sense. It com comes down to reproducible science again. Yeah, yeah we should go on and listen to the last panelist. So I'll ask uh, Fred, can we get the screen going for the laptop here? Do I have to skip over? Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay thanks. Fred. <clears throat> so let's try to be quick. Um, so first, I'm not a machine learner, and uh, I'm using machine learning only for very specific tasks, like looking for rare objects, classifying objects. Um, so let's no, we speak mostly of that experience. Um, now, <clears throat> uh, if we trust results or not depends on, of, as Lysia said and as uh, the others said, uh, what you want to do with the machine learning. If you want to fit you know, a simple model to 
to some data, probably machine learning is fine. If you want uh, to generate more images of your favorite type of, of objects, for example with GANs, that's probably okay as well. Now, if you want to use this as a training set to do further machine learning, that's probably not okay anymore. I don't have the answer to this question. If you want to process images, do denoising, deconvolution, at some point you will also face problems with machine learning. Already with you know, standard deconvolution, you face problems of conservation of flux. I think it's even worse with deconvolution, especially if your training set does not contain you know, the, the correct variety in, in the type of objects you want to deconvolve. Uh, if you want to correct biases, in fact, same problem for weak lensing. Maybe Alex will disagree on this. Uh, if you want to learn what biases you have when measuring the shapes of millions of galaxies to measure uh, weak lensing, you will have to face the problem of matching the simulations on the real data. You need simulations that are representative, representative of your data. For finding rare objects, I think you're fine, but it all depends if you want to be complete or pure or you know, what balance you adopt in your sample. And for emulators, so there I know nothing about this, but you know, my gut feeling is that it's probably fine to emulate cosmology, cosmological simulations with machine learning if you want the statistics, if you want the details, if you want zoomed in to zoom in your simulations, you're probably not okay, or you need a different type of machine learning, different type of uh, training set. Uh, so what would it take to believe the results? So first, you know, I don't like the word believing. You, know, you, 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 you accept the results, I was, uh, as was said in the, in the title of this talk. Uh, and I think convincing evidence that things work would be that machine learning can predict something we either expect or even better, that we don't expect. We should compare with standard methods. So that would be the analogy with you know, the ellipses of Lycia, you know, the blue things or that are the conventional <coughs> accepted uh, result versus the pink uh, ellipses that are more, uh, let's say, exotic. And you want really to design blind tests. And that's sometimes not even possible because we can't design training sets to do that. To do that. Now, what we should not do is to use machine learning for everything. So you all know the golden hammer law, give a hammer to someone uh, and then every, nail, uh, every uh, problem will be a nail. Uh, and not only this, you will also misuse, so this is called also the, the over-reliance on a familiar tool and even misuse of it. So you, if you know how to use the horse, and uh, you will still continue to use it even if you're given the car. And then you can have a train of things behind this. <coughs> um, okay, so do we always need machine learning? The answer is probably no. Uh, there are things we can do in, with, with completely standard techniques. Uh, and we need to check machine learning. So, computers do what they're told to do. Uh, if humans don't understand the problem in the first place, machine won't understand them neither. Uh, and there we come to the problem of checking what the machine does. So we've seen, for example, in this example, in this conference, that people could classify elliptical galaxies better than the human, but then how the human checks the machine. Uh, we also found you no know, very compact, strong gravitational lenses, but again, how do you check this? Uh, so, very often we do this by visual inspection or by doing citizen science, you, because you have tons of things to, uh, to check. Uh, here is an example of, uh, of classification, human uh, verification. So once we found lenses, in our case, in the Cephis Union survey, we had when six of us were checking the results of the neural network. So we had like you know, a few tens of uh, candidates to, uh, to, to, to verify, to check. And then the users seem to agree on the non-lenses. Why that? Because you know, everybody knows what's the, what is a non-lens and they're also much more probable. When it comes to the lenses or lens candidates, so the ones that, that are claimed to be lenses by the CNNs, then the disagreement uh, is, is much is much larger, and that's because humans also need have their own training. So I will just illustrate this. Uh, so if you're given this, and you're told, okay, my machine learning algorithm uh, finds that this is these are lenses. Uh, all the ones who are not familiar with gravitational lenses, I mean the human ones, will probably say this is likely a lens. Could be also a ring galaxy. 
this is something like an archy thing next to a galaxy, not sure it's a lens. But some people will say this is definitely a lens, this is definitely a lens, this is definitely a lens. Why? Because they have in mind these things. Uh, and that's HST images of the lenses. So you see immediately, if, you, if I show this, no, just this one, you will see, okay, that's definitely a lens. This one as well. Personally, I would say this one is probably a ring galaxy, but no, some of us in this case said obvious lens. So there is also a problem of knowledge, of no human knowledge to check what, what the machine learning does. Uh, another possibility, you, know, you add the color dimension to your survey. Okay, this is you know, faintish thing. If you wouldn't see that the four spots here around the lens are bluish and therefore star forming galaxies, you would probably see, say, well, just some four blobs around the galaxy. Then you go to the HST, that's what you get. So if you know this in advance, if you are used to see, you know, it's a bit like Siamese, um, uh, Siamese network, you know, when you're used to pair HST images and ground-based images in this case, you as a human learn that this thing that is blobby is probably a lens. If you show only this, so for example a beginner in, 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 in lens finding, you know, that haven't seen these kind of images will probably say that this is not a likely lens. For any given grade, it is given by the network. Uh, another example, okay, two lenses found in single band images. This is kind of a, an obvious quad. This is more tricky. Then add the color dimension. Okay, the image is not great. Uh, I don't know if you see better on the screen here. No, not even. <laughs> okay, you see immediately that you have some archy blue things here, while here you have a bunch of blobs with all the same intensity and color. Okay, anyway, forget this image, it's a bad color. Uh, <coughs> Then you also have to have to leave room for surprise. So what if I tell you this is lensing by a quasar? You know, that's what happened when we took a, a cake image of, of, of that object. So if you, if I tell you this, you will tell me, no, okay, it's probably not a lens, you know, convince me. And you don't have HST images. Then you go to some unconventional method, deconvolution. And you can do this either with or without machine learning. And then what you see, is an archy thing around the point source. Okay, not very convinced. So let's do it in another band. Okay, you have some confirmation of the arc. And then when a few years later you obtain the HST image, you know, that's the kind of thing you get. So obviously a quasar here in the center and some arcs in the, in the outer parts. So what I want to illustrate here is that you know, humans also have to learn how to check the, the networks. And the networks, of course, you can teach the network everything. You can give all the data to the network. But then what's the next step? How do you check the network has produced results that, you know, for which you don't have extra information to check, since the network has learned everything? OK, so by the way, there are many more of these, uh, of these quasar lenses. Okay, so if you want to check a lens is a lens, uh, the ultimate proof is supposed to be a model. You know, you fit a, a lens model to a, uh, to a lens and it fits, then you prove that it's a lens. So I claim that is not the case. So it, we did a, a, an experiment. We gave you know, a few lenses, so six of them are here. Six lens candidates to a, a, a master student. So, you know, fresh eyes, fresh mind. The student model everything and comes with this. So you know, you have three lenses here, three lens candidate here, the model each time in the second row, and the residuals. So if I tell you, if I show you these, these images, do you think the lenses are on the left or on the right? I, mean, I don't know, we, don't, we can't do a poll, maybe quickly we can have an opinion. So who thinks it's on yeah, the right? Raise your hands, raise your hands. Just the ones in the room, quickly. You think it's on the right? Come on. No one knows? Where are the best residuals? On the right. So these are the lenses, of course. And they're not. So, you know, <laughs> so in fact, you have inf here three lenses with three lens models. These are the residuals. And here you have three ring galaxies. So something blobby with a ring around it at the same redshift. And you, you fit better models on these. So if you trust the models, a referee, you know, when you publish lenses, they tell you, ah, why don't you have models? OK, models can fit the data and still give the wrong answer with or without machine learning. Um, 
Okay, this was just to show you that you can, you can go a step further. You have your six lenses, six re, uh, three lenses, three residuals, and that's the reconstructed mass, and that's the reconstructed source. And there you have the same, reconstructed mass for the ring galaxies this time, and reconstructed source. There is almost no difference. So you can't even say one is more physical than the other. Okay, that's all in the absence of redshift, but that's important because if you come to Euclid, for example, no, we won't have any redshift from the vast majority of, of, of lenses or lens candidates. Okay, so I think, no, that's just my personal opinion. I think I will be convinced that machine learning works only if we can predict something you expect. So that's a bit like, you know, in the quasar lensing case, or if you can predict something you completely don't expect at all. That will be, I think, one of the ultimate proofs that, that, that machine learning works. Um, you also need to predict the correct level of complexity with machine learning, but you know, it's, you've, you've seen the lens modeling that, that was done in the slides before. You, know, uh, you want to verify with a physical model that may not even be the proof in the end. So even if you have the correct physics in your machine learning simulations, you may not prove that things are correct, even when you check a posteriori with physical models, physically motivated models. Um, and then, yeah, so show the, showing that the training set you use is actually matching the real data. That's, I think, one, one of the most difficult points. And I think that's, in fact, the cause of failure, of most of the failures in machine learning. Now, you never have the correct training set. Now, I've seen many of these super optimistic rock and oak curves because you, know, you validate your, your machine learning uh, algorithm on, on the same type of simulated data that you used for the training in the first place, so they're super optimistic, then go to the real data, everything breaks down. Um, so the current validation schemes are not very convincing because you train within a parameter of space that you know already. And then about robustness, so is robustness really relevant? I don't think so. No, it's necessary but not sufficient. If your algorithm is robust, fine, but it may robustly converge always to the wrong solution. <laughs> That's just called bias. Um, okay, so then you know, just i leave you with a, a few additional sociological considerations. Now, the science community is usually very conservative. That was, in fact, one of the goals of the test of, of Lucia. Um, then, even though machine learning is a new powerful tool, well, powerful or popular tool, or both, uh, scientists are not really inclined to believe the results. Uh, and even more if the finding go against preconceived ideas. And we have seen the proof of this with, or some of the proof uh, with the test of Lycia. So thanks. Thanks very much for those comments. So would the panel like to respond uh, to uh, any comment on those? I, I remember, Fred, the story about how um, the gravitational lenses were actually visible in photographic plates, but people thought that they were defects on the plates until CCD cameras came around. Yeah, actually, it, it was yeah, n not only the worth, so there was no either defects or light echoes or bow shocks you know, in galaxy clusters. You know, it took a long time to convince that that lensing was you know, existing at all. But, and that took the development of CCDs, essentially. Yeah, and then there was also a sociological bias. Once people started to find a few ones, then everybody was seeing fake lenses everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm probably still now, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I, I have a comment, if I Sure, may. go ahead. Um, so, you said something very important. By the way, I love those images. I commented on the Slack. It's, that's a beautiful thing. And, and, and notice that the methods are making a prediction for what the HST data will show. And you comment on the fact that the prediction of new data is such an important thing. And I just want to comment, that's a really deep idea. So, so if you look at the machine learning community, as opposed to the astronomy community that uses machine learning. The machine learning community, many people in that community kind of only feel like the data exists and any theoretical things are just latents that, that are just used to predict in the space of the data. So when people talk about handwritten digits or whatever, they don't talk about the true model of how the digit is handwritten. They're trying to predict new data and classify new data and so on. Um, and we in astronomy tend to do plots like Leisha had with like a blue, 
banana and a purple banana, um, which are in the space of the latents, which are the things you can't observe. And we do all, we make all these arguments in the space of the latents. We argue about H naught from this thing and H from that, from that thing, and those are latents. But really the cosmological experiment should make a prediction for the Cepheids. And the Cepheid experiment should make a prediction for Planck and that's how we should be having this conversation. We shouldn't be having the conversation through the loops. We should be having the conversation in the space of the data. That would be a big change for astrophysics, but I think it might be necessary if we're really going to uh, use complex data methods. Hey, Chiara Ferrari, can you mute your, thank you. We have cosmic variance, so it's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> to the yeah. prediction for, say, what planks for the data. I agree, it's because difficult, but, the, the but name, otherwise, yeah. how are you going to believe? The, like, the, is there a conflict between... Because uh, the name of the, the, the game, the, right? Huh? It's not to predict the data. The name of the game is to predict whatever is in the ensemble of all the universes of which the one we observe is one particular realization. So it's a different name of the game. Well, the, the name of the game is to find what the model is, not to, uh, uh, not to work in the data space, I would say. Well, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, that's what we've decided, but that was a conscious decision we made, and that forced, that separated us from reality a little bit. But right, a good model has to be able to predict the data. Um, do we have uh, another comment from the panel, Alex, or...? Uh, well, but what aspect of the data, right? Yeah. Yeah. Some properties of the data. Yeah. So you may want to predict a power spectrum, not necessarily yeah. predict the entire CMB map. Yeah. But then if you predict the power spectrum, you may as well yeah. predict the cosmological parameter and plug them into CAMP. <laughs> Do we have some comments in the audience? There's, yeah, right at the back there, can someone give this guy a microphone? State your name and age and occupation. Yeah. Age as well, <laughs> Jesus. You're not allowed to ask someone their age. Um, yeah, Pablo. Lemos from Sussex. Um, so, a couple of comments. First of all, I think it's tricky to think of, like the Cepheids cannot predict the Planck data, right? That's the point. The Cepheids predict a, one parameter of a very complex data set. So you can, like the, the, the problem here at the generacies, right? And, and, and if, if the Cepheids predicted all lambda CDM, then, then we'd be in a different situation, but, but they don't. And in terms of doing comparisons in data space, people have, have thought about this. This um, Hirania, who's probably listening, has done predictive serial distributions and so on, where you can do predictions of the data, of data set A based on data set B and, and so on. So in fact, doing a prediction of the Cepheids with Planck, is, it's a, it's a five-minute exercise. But, but it doesn't, doesn't change the fact that you have a, an overall calibration. So, I mean, maybe another example, but in that specific example, I don't think it, it it, it's a particularly useful exercise because you just have a one parameter discrepancy. Yes, and maybe not. And I'm and I'm not and I I don't I, I but I I do think that astronomers do make a mistake when they so several people now have said that you can't predict the Planck data, but it's true that you cannot predict exactly what the Planck data will look like. However, you can write down a very low dimensional subspace that the Planck data has to live in if the Lambda CDM model is correct with the parameters yeah. it has. So though I agree that the example I'm giving is an idiotic example, I'm not really saying we should do that. I'm not, I, don't think we should, uh, con I don't think we should adopt the view that it's only a prediction if you can draw the exact picture. It is equally a prediction to put down a probability distribution in the space of the data. And actually, Haranya did comment comment in on the Slack. Um, and I think Haranya is one of the people who's most thinking in that direction. And I think it's really important because, because fundamentally the discrepancies are have to be at the level of the data. If you can't describe the discrepancy at the level of the data, is there a discrepancy? Yeah, the comment from Hirani on, on the Slack is we should be making posterior predictive comparisons in data space. I agree and some of, some of us are working towards that. Sorry, no, I'm forward modeling the all the way. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. I agree with doing predictions, comparing the data space. I think it's, it's really good. But then comes the problem and kind of relates to the beginning of the conference, like Ben's talk and so on, that we, because we're, we're limited in how much we can visualize and understand, you're only going to make predictions in the, some kind of 
summary statistic data space, right? And then, and then if that summary statistic happened to be missing the part of the information that would show you the discrepancy, then, then, then you're not, not going to see it. But, but I agree that, that moving to looking at things in data space is, is definitely good. Are there any more comments from the audience? <clears throat> Who on the panel would like to have the last word? Uh, uh, there is Sorry. a comment. I was hiding Sorry, behind I a lamp. You. Sorry. I'll stick my head up. Hey, it's it's hey, Niall Jeffrey. Um, so um, just on uh, Frederic's talk, uh, I should preface it by saying I strongly agree with the golden hammer concept, especially when I feel like now, because students really enjoy machine learning, they get a problem, could be fitting a line to data, they know the covariance, but nevertheless, they want to plug it into a neural network because that sounds cool. Uh, but on the other hand, pushing against that, I want to be slightly more optimistic. There was a big list of things at the start of problems in cosmology, weak lensing bias, and so on. And to me, they all seem like things that can be modeled, and therefore, one can use machine learning um, in a likelihood-free or simulation-based framework to do better than we can now. And we can't do worse, because if you can write down a model, you can, you can use machine learning to do better, but you can't get worse if you're thorough and rigorous and so on. So that was a bit of pushing back and, and yeah, hopefulness. Maybe, maybe the whole thing was a bit too pessimistic, but I was listing the, you know, if you want to solve something, usually you want to solve problems, not solve questions. So <laughs> hence the list. Um, but I, I think that's a very nice point. Actually, you, that whoever just said, spoke uh, did make two, I think, really important things. One is the concept of rigor. Like, I think it's really important for us to be rigorous. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why I'm interested in these exact symmetries, which maybe, you know, maybe in the end, everything's so broken that the exact symmetries won't help us. But it's a place where we can just be more rigorous. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is to identify areas where by turning on machine learning or including machine learning, we can't do worse. I think it's a really important thing to think about where are those places? Because there's a lot of places where you can turn on the machine learning and you might do better, you might do worse, you don't know. But there are some places where you turn it on and you know you'll do better. And that is exciting. And that's something where I think we really should focus our efforts if we want to have a kind of long-lasting impact of this. That's a super positive point. <coughs> uh, would anyone like to add another comment, Licia? So are we supposed to sort of try to close, or? Well, it's the end now, yeah. so <laughs> yeah. closing okay. remarks. So let's, let's, let me go towards <coughs> closing. closing. Remarks. Let me go towards closing. In the spirit, in the spirit of uh, yesterday, try to come up with the quote of the day. <coughs> Let me propose a quote of the day, and then see if, uh, if uh, it's, it's, it's too um, controversial that not all information is created equal. Mm. So the kind of information you may want to re retain may depend on what kind of information it is. So not all information is created equal. <coughs> Nobody else? I would say mine is trust, trust but verify. Um, anyone else? Uh, so I, I add one thing. I think yes. I would say, you know, computers are getting more and more powerful, and I think the machine learning algorithm will beat the humans. Yeah. In fact, I think we're in a transition period. I think we have to get used to it, and I think rigor indeed is very important um, so that we can trust these results. But it's, it's only the beginning, and so I would, I would, I would just okay. get used to this. That's lovely. So I think we have to... Uh, leave there because it's a, lo a lovely way to end. And uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, the pa <laughs> thank you to all the panelists for a very uh, inspiring and interesting discussion. And thank you for the, to the organizer to help us with the interactive <laughs> okay. bit, which uh, I understand it was a challenge, okay. but it worked. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, David and uh, Alex, for joining remotely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, great. So Sorry, I couldn't be there. I, my, I'm very much missing the food as well as the company. We're going to go to a nice restaurant now. So. Damn you. <laughs> <laughs>